So what is the new paradigm? You're going into a new level of relationships now. What is the new paradigm that is coming through? Okay, well, the new paradigm has to do with the end of domination, for one thing. Nobody mm -hmm. dominates anybody, you know, and if you think about your parents' relationship, usually the father was dominating the mother, or, mm -hmm. or the mother's dominating the father, or somebody's dominating mm -hmm. somebody. That has to go. That will not work in the new energy that's out there now. And things like competition, anger, um, you know, constant fighting, that's typical of the old paradigm. And mm. the new paradigm is the paradigm of joy and peace and what the Course in Miracles calls a holy relationship versus the old paradigm, which was called an unholy relationship. Oh, the holy relationship and the special relationship. The, the holy relationship is quite different than the special relationship. The special relationship, according to the Course in Miracles, is where you find this one person, you love them more than anybody else, more than yourself, even more than God, you know, and uh, it's not gonna so work. Yeah. And, uh, and Give so- Give your the, power away. Yes, and the Course says it's the ego's chief weapon to keep you from God, because you're so occupied with this relationship, you don't even have time for your spiritual life, you know. So the holy relationship is totally different, ball of wax. It's where each person looks within himself and he sees no lack and he accepts his completion and he feels whole mm -hmm. as himself, whole, W-H-O-L-E, and he finds somebody else who's whole and they get together and they share the light with the world. Mm -hmm. So this is two full cups running over on each other, two people with total self-esteem who are equals. So it's more synergistic. And it's a spiritual partnership is what it is. Mm -hmm. It's a sacred union of a spiritual partnership and they're together for the evolution of their souls. And they both know this. <laughs> Good. So for instance, in that new paradigm, and say these people, two people are in a relationship and they have an argument, what is the resolution in this new paradigm? Okay, well, I prayed a lot about this and I got some good answers. Mm -hmm. And I, I came up with, in meditation, the idea of the highest spiritual thought. Mm -hmm. So instead of arguing about something, you both, you and your partner, drop your positions and you're open to the highest possible thought on this subject. Now, the highest spiritual thought would be the most positive, the most loving, the most productive, and it feels the best in your body. And if my mate gets the highest spiritual thought, I go up to his thought, gladly. Mm -hmm. If I get the highest spiritual thought, he goes up to my thought. Now, if we both can't agree on the highest thought, we don't argue about that. We would meditate or call a third party in to help us decide. Instead of arguing, we're, we're gonna surrender to the highest spiritual thought. And sometimes the Can children we? in the house will get it. Because oh. children are channels. They can sometimes tell you the highest thought. And so that would work. <laughs> and also, I think you mentioned before too, you would call in the Divine Mother, you'd have the triangle, you'd, have, you'd offer the highest point right. to the um, Divine Mother. And offer it to the Holy Spirit or the Divine Mother or higher power, and that's what works. Instead of like this, you're giving it up to a higher power. Mm. Why is it, do you think, that marriage doesn't work these days? It's like two in five people get divorced. <laughs> what, what do you think? Is this because we're shifting from the old paradigm into the new paradigm and we're out of the old paradigm, we're not yet into the new? That's part of it, but it's basically because the, the parties do not have their subconscious clear. Because what happens in marriages, uh, especially it's more intense with marriage, uh, your personal lie clashes with the other person's personal lie. Your birth trauma collides with their birth trauma. Mm. Your patterns, your family patterns collide with their family patterns and it's all the subconscious material banging together and mm -hmm. then they argue about it instead of clearing it in the new part of paradigm each person takes responsibility for clearing their subconscious and you know the best gift you could give to a mate would be a clear consciousness that and the best gift you could give to a child as a parent would be a subconscious that was clear that's why rebirthing is so good because it brings the unconscious to the conscious so you can clear it good. without drugs without hypnosis good let's go back to the question of what is the unconscious death urge can you explain that a little bit right this is a very very interesting question. I'm glad you asked that because I like this question. Yeah. <laughs> it, it's about very all, important. it's like a conglomerate in the subconscious which contains the following. It contains the belief that death is inevitable, which is a thought it could change. Uh, it, cha it contains all your past life memories of dying, mm -hmm. uh, all your amp programming from your ancestors when mm. they died, and then your belief systems about that that you have to copy them. 
Uh, it contains all your anti-life thoughts. It could contain your personal lie, which could kill you if you keep thinking it. <laughs> oh and sometimes it contains your secret wish to die if you hate your life, you know. And yeah. all of that together is what we call the unconscious death urge. And literally, it's a consciousness factor that has to be released if you want to live well. And you breathe it out, and you become more alive and more alive, and you get more energy. And uh, you know, a lot of these people who have diseases like chronic fatigue and Epsom Barr, it's mm -hmm. really just their unconscious death urge that's coming up. And that's we've had really a lot of healings on those issues and rebirthing. It's not hard for us to help people with that. Well, I know Leonard Orr says, until you've cleared the unconscious death urge, all healing is temporary. That's right, so because uh, very if I taught anyone how to heal cancer or, or, or we did the ultimate truth process on something and they got healed, if they didn't handle the death urge, they'd just make up a new way to kill themselves. Mm. Oh my goodness, mm. that's right. Mm -hmm. So it's very, very important. Right, and rebirthing uh, is taking the lead in that area of really studying physical immortality. Do you want to explain the concept and the practice of physical immortality? Right. Physical immortality means that you have, you develop the ability to stay in your physical body and live as long as you choose by the power of your mind and practicing certain spiritual laws. And it was in the Bible because, um, first of all, Jesus was teaching it. He said, you know, uh, death is a result of a thought called the ego is part of the Course in Miracles teaching, and he said uh, the power of life and death are in the tongue, in the mm. Bible, which is the same thing. The power of life right. and death are in the tongue means whatever you say is what you get with your body. You right. see, and most people are saying, I'm getting old, and so they do, or I'm going to die at such, and they're, they're programming themselves for their death, and they're copying their parents. So it is, it is in the Bible, and uh, the way out is you have to give those thoughts up and you have to have a spiritual purification technique to keep youthing yourself, which when I took rebirthing to Russia, we, we had the fortune of having doctors get rebirthed and they proved it produces a rejuvenation of the body, scientifically proved it. Well, I think that's fascinating because what we tend to do is take on our ancestors' patterns. We have to look at their illnesses and so and so on and so on, grandparents, parents, so that we don't take on those illnesses. We tend to take on not only the illnesses, but the emotions around them. Mm -hmm. um, a lot of people die at the same age of their grandparents, you know. Yeah, it's mm -hmm. incredible. But mm -hmm. most people will say, well, why would you want to live forever? But that's coming from a deathless mentality, isn't it? I'm because glad they're you in brought pain that and misery. Be because, you know, if you were in living forever in an old body mm -hmm. with a lot of pain, you wouldn't want to. You wouldn't to. want to. So what we mean by it is you keep using your body and you stay young and you get rid of the pain. And then you might want to live a long time. And, and the purpose of it is not so you can walk around and brag that you're 200 years old. Yeah. <laughs> That's not the purpose of it. The purpose is because you are on a mission of divine service, you know, that you can serve humanity and serve God with your abilities and stay healthy doing it. Absolutely. And did you know that Sandra Ray is 108 years old today? <laughs> Doesn't she look wonderful? <laughs> it's funny. No, it's fascinating. And so, um, let me see. So from there, you went on to create the Divine Mother uh, movement. Right. I was in Santa Fe, and I went to visit a teacher, and I walked in the door. I'd never met her, and she said, oh, you, they want you to do something beyond the feminist movement. And I said, what? I hadn't even sat down yet. Mm -hmm. And I was so shocked, you know, and uh, I'm meaning the spiritual hierarchy. They. And I said, uh, could I please have more information? And she said, no, because it's never been done. <laughs> Tomorrow you decide if you want to accept this mission and you do a ceremony. So you didn't have <laughs> a clue what it was, no. what it was about. You were just and winging so it. And so I thought, OK, this, this is something I must have maybe uh, chosen before I incarnated, and I don't remember or something. So I uh, set up an altar the next day, and I wrote a letter to the spiritual hierarchy. And I said, if I was born for this, OK, I agree. But could I have more information? <laughs> and then this, this kind of storm went through the house. It was something really powerful. And I still couldn't get what it was. And you know, I actually got a pain in my hip for a couple of months. I was so nervous mm -hmm. to go forward with something. Then I went to India, and I did a ceremony in India. And uh, I suddenly, I realized it was the Divine Mother Movement, because all my spiritual teachers, who were male at the time, 
their secret of their miracles and their power was they all prayed to the Divine Mother. And I didn't even get it at first. Mm. And um, then we actually have a Divine Mother um, ceremonies that we do called Navaratri, nine straight days of worship to the Divine Mother. And I realized, wow, the Divine Mother is like the original spark of creation. So you are, which is a feminine aspect. So you're worshiping life itself. And then I started all making sense to me. And they say in India, there's nothing higher than worship of the Divine Mother because it's like the intelligence behind matter, yeah. you know. And so then I thought, wow, this is really it. And I started asking for um, guidance to understand why I'm supposed to do this. And I, I was shown many, many miracles to explain the power of the Divine Mother over the following years. And I have written a book about it. It's not out yet, but I have written a whole book about it. So, so how that did changed you... my life drastically. Yeah. So you went to India to the Babaji Ashram in Herakon. We'll talk about Babaji mm -hmm. in a minute. And so you did a ceremony with a few rebirthers, all women, in mm -hmm. the Ganges River, and you put oil and rose petals right. over, and you pray to the Divine Mother as mm -hmm. to what this this mission was going to be. And I asked them to help me. I said, if any of you get it, please tell me because I, I wasn't getting it. But then after we finished the ceremony, I started working, walking toward the Duni, which is the Divine Mother Fire Temple. Right. And then I heard Divine Mother movement in my head and I thought, wow, this is it. So then I started doing ceremonies uh, to activate that and I kept I kept saying Divine Mother Movement and all these ceremonies and I did three or four ceremonies. I thought, wow, now I've really committed to this and I still wasn't really clear what mm. it was, but I knew that was the right thing because I heard it in my head. So then I came down and everything that was not According to that, just fell apart in my organization, and then I had to start all over, and it was it became so beautiful. Everything changed. Everything. Oh, was so that's when the LRTs mm. were complete, and then you rolled into the Divine Mother yeah, movement. Yeah, and everything just became so flowing and beautiful as I went more into the feminine side, because I had mm. been too much in my masculine side trying to make things happen. And uh, so my whole life completely changed after I surrendered to the Divine Mother. And I think the Divine Mother has the answer to all our problems in the world today, and that's why I think it's really important we, we ask for that. Absolutely, because I think right now with all the wars going on, this is what we need. The planet needs nurturing, it needs a feminine energy, we need peace, we need calm, mm -hmm. and we need to tap into that higher right. energy. Right. Wonderful. And I saw so many miracles. I know the Divine Mother can heal anything, create anything, so I know we can get all the answers from her. Would you like to talk a little bit about that during uh, some of your Divine Mother conferences where you'd had people had healings during the Divine Mother coming through? Yes, well, people uh, even today in my rebirthings and groups, they see Amaji. For example, now we've been studying with Amaji, the hugging saint. Mm -hmm. People see Amaji in their rebirthings. They see Babaji, of course, as they always have. But now that we're getting people see the Virgin Mary, there we're getting yeah. more and more people having visions in their rebirthings of the feminine aspect of God. And, uh, you know, there could be Durga or in Hawaii, we say Madame Paley. I wrote a whole book on that. And, you know, it's like now the feminine is coming through in these rebirthings and people mm. are just getting healed. It's so beautiful. Okay, so let's talk about Babaji. Who is Babaji and how did you meet him? Okay, great. Babaji has been my master for many lifetimes, but in this lifetime he is uh, known as Maha Avatar, which means mm -hmm. he was not born of a woman. He actually materialized his body directly from the source or the ethers. And uh, this was witnessed by people who saw a ball of light uh, descending in this cave. That's where they found him. And then he sat for 40 days and 40 nights without eating, sleeping, or drinking anything. And he just uh, held up his hand and blessed people. And he kept his eyes closed because he was so powerful. People would faint. And so then the Indian devotees that he knew from other lifetimes gathered around in 1977. We got a letter and it said, Leonard Orr, 301 Lion Street, San Francisco, and I happened to be running the office. And I remember this letter was very strange and there's no return address and no signature. It just said, come to India. Oh my goodness. And so Leonard got this idea. I said, we've been called, Leonard, and he got this idea we should go with 12 rebirthers and that we should uh, land in Bombay. We had to pick some city. And we should all split up and look for different gurus. And so that's what we actually did. Mm -hmm. And so we, we spent two weeks in different parts. I went south, somebody went north, somebody else went different places. And we met in two weeks in New Delhi and compared stories. And Leonard had met another guru there. We thought maybe it was the one. Mm -hmm. But there was one girl missing 
in our party, and you, know, you can't find a missing person in India. No. <laughs> so impossible. we had to just go home without her, and I was freaked out. I was so concerned, you know, and uh, she hadn't come home for seven months. And when she came in the door, I was there, and she said, I found the real Babaji. And, you know, we almost fainted. We couldn't believe it. The hero of the 